great innovation stories make change possible. Each week on the Innovation Storytellers podcast, I invite innovation leaders to share how they overcame the obstacles to introduce breakthrough ideas to the world through the power of story. I'm featuring guests from Tesla, TD Ameritrade, Corning, Cisco, Bloomberg, and so many more. Listen in to learn how you can tell a more effective innovation story and change the future for the better. I'm your host, Susan Lindner, back for another episode of Innovation Storytellers. And you might have noticed over the last couple of weeks, we've been taking more of an environmental focus on with some of our guests. And that's why I'm truly thrilled to have Brad Ack joining me today. Brad is the Executive Director and Chief Innovation Officer at Ocean Visions. Now, if you don't know Ocean Visions, you should. And I'm going to let Brad tell you more about the organization. Brad is an environmental innovator whose work has spanned from tropical forests and high deserts to extensive work throughout the global ocean. Brad has worked for government and NGOs, often in concert with innovation ecosystems, designing and implementing some of the most innovative conservation and sustainability initiatives in the world. He now spends all of his time working to reverse the interlocking ocean and climate crises. And Brad, I'm just so thrilled to have you here with me today talking about these topics that are so urgent and are so present for all of us, whether we're thinking about it every day or not, it's happening, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Susan. So thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about how you got into this space. Uh, you know, we often say on the show, nobody gets into innovation with any intention, right? It just kind of happens when we realize stuff's not working out the way it's supposed to be working out. Right. Yeah. Well, I've been in the environmental uh, space my whole career. I started working on you know, sort of what was considered back in the day, sustainable development right after graduate school. And, and really, the whole concept of innovation is woven into what sustainable development is, right? We, we came up with that term, sustainable development, because we realized that our conventional development patterns were actually were severely impacting the biosphere upon which we all depend, essentially eroding our natural capital that provides all of the goods and services that allow us to exist on the planet and to thrive and prosper. And so the concept of sustainable development was, well, we need to change these development patterns in some way so that they don't degrade and destroy our natural capital. And so that Im embodies innovation, right? It means you have to try to do the same things you're doing, but in a different way for a far better result. And so throughout my career, every environmental problem that I've worked on, and there's been quite a range of them across different biomes, have always involved trying to find innovative ways. And they don't always have to be technology. Sometimes it's technology. Sometimes it's, it's policy. Sometimes it's governance. Sometimes it's finance. But new ways of reframing the same system to produce a different outcome. So I think good conservation and good environmental management embodies innovation just by definition, really. Yeah, but it's also a sense of focus, right? I mean, for how long, and I'm curious, for how long have we been going about our business thinking, I'm a good corporate citizen, I'm, I'm doing the best I can within the confines of understanding what quarterly earnings are and needing to meet those quarterly earnings. I keep thinking about the shift in stewardship and what we thought stewardship meant, you know, through the phase of our fledgling humanity, let's say. And mm -hmm. what does it mean to actually care for something? Because for a long time, stewardship meant first I steward me, then I steward the earth, right? And so I'm curious what your own view on that, what, what does it mean to be a steward of the earth at all? It's a great question. And I think, you know, our conception has really changed over time as we've become more and more technologically proficient. And also as we've just understood more and more about the world that we live in, you know, early on in human history, the world seemed limitless, boundless, completely inexhaustible, right? Mm -hmm. And, and in fact, we felt that way probably early in the 19th uh, and 20th century, or early in the 20th century, you know, the beginning, the turn of last century, people probably still had that sense that anything was possible and the world was limitless. And over, over the course of the 20th century, and certainly now into the 21st century, we know 
beyond a shadow of a doubt that we live in a finite biosphere. We are part of a contained system that has a finite atmosphere. It has finite freshwater systems, finite soil. It's, it is like a spaceship, as um, has been pointed out many times in the past. And now we need to learn to manage all the parts of the system that we depend on. We are the apex predator, as they would say in, in sort of conservation biology terms. But it may be a better way to say it, we are the most advanced life form on the planet. And we now recognize that stewardship means being very attentive to all of the component parts of this extremely complex system that we depend on for our lives and all the other beings on the planet depend on for their lives. So stewardship is now very vastly more complicated than it ever was before. And it's essentially like being you know, the captain and crew of an incredibly complex spaceship. Mm. You know, it's funny because it, a spaceship inherently implies um, a sense of finiteness, right? <laughs> we are in this totally. big blue marble that's just hurtling through the sky equal to a rocket ship, right? And all the, it strikes me sometimes because all the components for our living were were made manifest and were here for us. You can decide if it was put here or if it was big banged here, whatever. But there's a sense of perfection about how these systems integrate with one another. How challenging do you find it for the people that you're trying to influence? And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about them, about taking a systems approach, taking a holistic approach to solving problems. So tell us a little bit more about Ocean Visions, the mission, and then how you go about influencing these constituents, these key audiences of yours. Mm -hmm. So Ocean Visions is a relatively recent organization created in, it was conceived of in 2017, 2018, formally launched in 2019. It is a partnership, a, a sort of a novel partnership of academic and research institutions with a focus in oceanographic sciences partnering with a number of players in the private sector, especially entrepreneurs and inventors and investors to bring new solutions, to uh, catalyze new solutions um, coming from this sort of cross-sectoral co-design approach. So the fundamental uh, premise of Ocean Visions is that it's going to take a multi-sector community to really be able to envision, invent, test, iterate on, and ultimately deploy solutions. It's going to take multiple disciplines, multiple perspectives working together. And so Ocean Visions embodies that philosophy and tries to bring those sectors together. We have chosen to focus uh, because we are Ocean Visions and our, you know, our reason for being is around the health and uh, vitality and future of the ocean. We have focused on an issue that very few other ocean-based organizations or ocean-focused organizations have really spent much time on, which is trying to abate and reverse the climate crisis, which is unraveling our ocean. So our foundational premise on that program direction is that the two biggest drivers of change to our ocean uh, and ultimately to our planet are coming from the excess carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases that we have released into the atmosphere and which now also reside in the upper layer of the ocean. This excess greenhouse gas is driving enormous amounts of heat into the ocean. You've probably heard the statistic that some 93% of all the excess heat trapped by greenhouse gases has gone into the ocean, which has saved humanity by the way, because otherwise it would be 30 to 40 degrees centigrade warmer on land than it is now. Wow. But that heat, that massive amount of heat, and it really is massive. It's been calculated at around five Hiroshima bomb equivalents of heat, uh, that size of an atomic bomb going into the ocean every second, every second of every minute of every day. That's how much excess heat we've been driving into the ocean over the last 40 to 50 years. And that heat is unraveling in the ocean. So it causes sea level rise. It, it interrupts the uh, mixing of the, or in the mid layer of the ocean, which is how nutrient is, uh, nutrients are exchanged and how much of the base of the food chain subsists. 
it affects oxygen levels in the ocean. It's causing poleward migration of fish species. There mm. are a whole host of effects from that heat. And then secondly, a bunch of the CO2 that we've put into the atmosphere has just been absorbed into the upper layer of the ocean around 30% of all that enormous amount of excess CO2. And that is acidifying the ocean, making the ocean more corrosive, changing the, the fundamental chemistry of the ocean. So Ocean Visions has set out with that analysis in mind to say, we need to work on efforts that will actually directly affect the cause of that problem. The cause of that problem is too much CO2 in the atmosphere. So how do you address that problem? You look at how can you remove, well, there's two pathways. One is you shut off the flow of CO2 into the atmosphere. And that's what people have been working on for the last 60, 50 years, you know, trying to decarbonize every aspect of our modern society. And I'm sorry to say that it's not working very well so far. We're we're dangerously behind the curve as the most recent uh, report from the IPCC just this week showed. So now we have to focus on the other part of that solution, which is pulling it, cleaning up that pollution, right? So you have a pollution problem. You can turn off the tap, which requires enormous innovation, the redesign of our entire economic system, and you can clean up the mess, which also requires an enormous amount of innovation because carbon dioxide, even though it is blanketing our atmosphere, it is still at very low levels, you know, 415 parts per million. That's how much carbon is in the atmosphere. So even though it's far too much, it's still very difficult to capture it and get, get it back and then store it safely. So the next sort of generation of innovation in the climate space is going to be around how do we do that at very large scales. So there's no moonshot idea, literally, of, you know, Jeff Bezos putting our carbon on a rocket ship and shooting it into space, right? That's not going to happen. There is not a single moonshot. There's not going to be one solution to this carbon management problem that we have. We've released an excess of something like over a trillion tons of carbon that otherwise would not be in the atmosphere and the water had we not built our economy on fossil fuels. So that's a really large amount. We need an innovation ecosystem across many sectors and across the oceans and terrestrial approaches in order to try to solve this problem. And I'll, I'll say on the, you know, on the bright side, because it is a really large problem, but it's a defined problem. We understand it. And if we can shift some of our resources and investments of our own time and energy towards addressing it, this might become one of the largest economic sectors of the future. Because cleaning up this carbon is an economic imperative. If we want to have healthy economies, healthy lives, and you know prosperity, we've got to get this pollution out of the system. So, you know, I'm a chief innovation officer listening to this podcast, right? And I'm thinking about my supply chain. I'm thinking about what my innovation portfolio looks like over the next three to five years. You're an innovator, you know, by title, right? And in the doing. So talk to our listeners as innovators themselves, working in large corporations, what does that first step into innovating the innovation supply chain look like? What should an innovator be talking about? And what's that conversation sitting down at the boardroom table to say, you know, here's what we're planning over the next three to five years. We need to add another layer around sustainability to whatever it is we're planning over the next three to five years. Y you know, it's hard to eat an elephant. What's the first bite, Brad, mm -hmm. that innovators should be thinking about in their planning of products and services? Because these are the guys designing the future. We know we need the today. But right. even, you know, as part of that, what do you need from innovate from the innovation community? It's a good question. And I my first reaction really is that it starts first with a disruptive, different view of what the challenge is, right? I think that it's hard to innovate in the absence of an enabling environment that, that starts with clear statement, a clear understanding of what the problem is and what the, what the challenges are to solve that problem. So let me give you an example. There's a whole bunch of companies that have bought into this concept 
that we should be aiming for net zero by 2050, right? I'm sure people in your audience have heard this net zero by 2050, which means net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Is that the reason they say is that feels still so far away? Well, I'm just going to make it harder for you in a second then, because I would argue (laughs) that target is a dangerous and unsafe target. Mm -hmm. So net zero by 2050 means that where we are right now with 416 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, driving these horrible wildfires and droughts and floods and loss of coral reefs. And, you know, we could go on and on. That problem is only going to get worse. Net zero by 2050 means we'll have 460 parts per million of carbon, of CO2 in the atmosphere. Humans haven't existed on the planet at those levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The last time carbon dioxide levels were this high, as they are right now, sea levels were, uh, are, were projected to be about 30 feet higher than they are right now. And there were camels in the... So we are already at really dangerous levels. And the net zero by 2050 is not a great goal. It's all of us agreeing that we're just going to let the world get worse off uh, tomorrow than it is today. So I think it starts, I say all that because it starts with reframing the goal. We need to go net negative. We need to go backwards. We need to restore our climate. We have done grievous damage to our climate and we all depend on it. It's like you know, damaging the outer layer of the spaceship that protects you from the heat in an analogous situation. You damage it too much and and it's over, right? We need to start rebuilding it. In our case, we need to restore and repair our climate. So there are examples of companies that have recognized that. Microsoft being at the very top of the list, they have created a pledge to be net negative. They're going to be net zero by 2030 and have will have cleaned up at least they have projected this, cleaned up their entire carbon footprint by 2050. That, once you set that as a framework, then all of a sudden your innovation sphere looks really different because you've just set yourself an enormously challenging goal, but it's the right goal. Mm -hmm. And therefore now your people are free to start really blue sky thinking about what it's going to take to get there. And so obviously if you're going to be, if you're going to be net negative and clean up much of the footprint, that means, first of all, you've got to stop all the flow of carbon into the environment. So you've got to focus an enormous amount of resource on the decarbonization of your supply chain. But you got to go farther than that. You've got to join forces with other companies that are working on creating the framework for large scale carbon removal and safe storage. And that's what Microsoft is doing. They have a coalition of companies. I think it's called the Net Impact Coalition, if I'm not mistaken, that are working towards this goal of negative. And so that's a long winded answer, but it starts with having the right goal. If you don't have the right goal, then, you know, it's like the old saying, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will get you there. You have to have the right goal. And in this case, let's set a goal that actually leaves the world at least as good as we found it, rather than significantly worse than we are today, which is what net zero by 2050 is. So I want to look at that just for a moment, this restore and repair. It feels like, it's like, do we even have a moment to restore and repair versus stop doing the stuff that we're currently doing? Is that a backward looking metric to say, I have to own what I've done to the planet thus far as a company, and it's my job to fix what I've done to it? Is that the mindset around restore and repair? So I I would frame it differently than that. I would say, you know, this is an opportunity that we have as citizens of the planet. And we who are powerful companies are in a privileged position to be able to try to help solve this problem. And our economic future depends on it. It, you know, it makes good economic sense over the long term. And it it certainly makes good corporate uh, citizenship sense. And corporations have enormous tools to be able to deal with this. To to the first part of your question, it's not an either or, it's a yes and. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have to stop doing the damage. Absolutely. No doubt. Mm -hmm. And we have to repair the damage that we've done because were we to zero out all CO2 and methane emissions tomorrow, we would still face a deteriorating planet. 
because we have unlocked through the heat that's already in the system, the excess energy that's already been driven into the system. We've sort of created cycles that can't be reversed until we go into some cooling, like the loss of Arctic ice, for example, or the loss of the Greenland and uh, Antarctic ice sheets or the loss of coral reefs. How do we restore and repair an ice sheet? You know, well, we have to start cooling. Problem. The first yeah. thing is we've got to start cooling rather than warming. So, you know, we've got to wrap our minds around bringing those concentrations of CO2 down. If it turns out, and it might, if it turns out that we can't cool the planet fast enough by both shutting off the flow of pollution and, and cleaning up the pollution, we're going to have to look at what I call hedging strategies to buy time for those systems, which means are there things that we can do to help prolong those critical parts of the global climate system while we balance our carbon budget and while we slowly help cool the planet? And that might be things like, and there's been proposals, for example, trying to pump uh, water up onto the sea ice during the winter to build it up higher and higher so that there's more of it in the summer to withstand the summer heat. This is not, you know, this is science fiction, but it's not outside the realm of possibility. And I'll just, I'll just go a little deeper on this concept of sea ice. About 30% of all the warming to date that this planet has experienced is projected to have come from the loss of sea ice and the absorption of heat into the Arctic and the lack of reflectivity of that heat because ice reflects and water doesn't. So 30% of our global warming problem to date has come from the loss of that critical part of our system. So restoring and rebuilding that part of our system could make an awful lot of sense. So those are the kind of things that we're going to be thinking about. Yeah, Brett, who, you know, as a listener, it's like, who is responsible for the Greenland ice sheet, for the Antarctic ice sheet. And we can say all of us, but it feels like that old saying, you can't boil the ocean. You know, like ultimately someone has to say, I'm finding the solution, I'm paying for the solution, I'm executing on the solution, and I'm accountable for that solution. So where does the responsibility lie in your mind and, you know, with Ocean Visions? Who, Who should be the handlers of that? Yeah. Well, I think it has to be it has to be the governments of the world through the existing institutions that we've created to deal with sort of massive global problems. But I think just like we need corporations to reframe what the goal is and and move away from net zero and look at at net negative and, and restoration, we need to start truly acting as a global community like this is an emergency that we keep saying it is. The Secretary General of the United Nations, you know, a few weeks back called this a code red for humanity, right? This is not the head of a radical left wing, you know, or right wing uh, organization. This is the head of the United Nations calling this a code red for humanity based on the science. We are not acting like it's a code red. Imagine any movie you've seen where there is a code red, right? First of all, there's really a loud siren and alarms are going off and lights are blinking and people are running around. People are only working on one thing. We've got to solve the situation that's causing this. We are not acting like that. We did act like that to a degree in COVID and the world governments and the world civil society and the corporate sector came together to prioritize working on the creation of of a vaccine or multiple vaccines, the creation of therapies to treat sick people. Yeah. Or turning a GM motor plant into a respirator factory. Right. Exactly. That's exactly right. So until we truly embrace the fact that we are living in an emergency, it's just much slower than anything we're used to calling an emergency, but we have big enough brains and enough observational capacity to know that this is true that it really is an emergency and that the trend lines are extremely frightening and we have to mobilize and act in a way that we have not to date. And then things like your question of how would we possibly shore up the Greenland ice sheet become questions for multiple governments and scientific institutions and and the private sector. And I'll just give you an example of how that's not happening. There are more scientists that focus on the Arctic than maybe any other system on the planet. 
because they come from many countries. There's many countries with Arctic uh, programs, including countries like India and China. So it's not just the Arctic nations. There are almost no Arctic scientists working on the question of how could we rebuild and prolong sea ice. Why? Because it's not been put out there as an emergency that needs to be addressed. Right. And do you also see, well, you know, it's funny. I had the, one of my guests recently was the head of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory from NASA. And and it was a fascinating conversation because I asked him, how does NASA imagine the next 50 years of space travel? How do we innovate space travel constantly? And he said, we actually invite screenwriters from Hollywood. We invent, we invite futurists and we couple those with the, you know, astrophysicists and the scientists that are native to NASA and some that are outside of this group. And we sit down and together we imagine what the future of space travel is. Love it. And what space exploration is. And it literally begins as a fiction, as a Mm -hmm. dream. Right. And then solutions are developed and made as a result of that kind of, you know, blue ocean thinking, as you were referring to it as where is that imagineering body that is thinking these solutions through right now, Brad? That's a great question. And I love that. I love that story. You know, I'll tell you a person who I think is worth reading, Kim Stanley Robinson. He's a science fiction writer. He calls himself a utopian science fiction writer. He just wrote a book in 21, published in 21, called Ministry for the Future. Fascinating, set about 40 to 50 years in the future when the climate shocks have started to really accelerate and countries, some countries have started to take independent action to deal with cooling the planet, such as solar radiation modification. But he goes into details on a host of innovations that span things like how would you shore up the Thwaites ice sheet uh, in Antarctica by pumping the meltwater that is the water underneath the sheet that's actually melting it back up onto the surface and the enormous engineering that would take two things like creating a new digital currency based on carbon removal. So he's got a range of extremely innovative ideas in this book. And he goes into great detail in a very compelling way. Is there a body that does that? I mean, maybe the futurist society and others like that are having these conversations and you've just given me a motivation to reach out and find out if that's the case, because I think that's exactly right. You know, the part of our problem especially in the environmental and conservation community, is that there is a strong degree of technophobia and there is a very much a preservation mentality. That's where the whole community came from. Let's just protect what's there. Let's just set it aside. And that worked back in the day. But now setting things aside just means you know they're going to get impacted by all these forces that are coming from outside the, the boundaries, right? Like you, national parks are not protected from wildfires just not. They're not protected from drought. Marine protected areas are not protected from ocean acidification or from ocean warming. There's only one, you know, we're going to need new tools. And that means imagining first what those new tools might be. And some of them sound crazy, but yet, you know, we have a lot of technology that we're using right now in our everyday lives that 20 years ago would have sounded insane. Right. Thanks to Star Trek and the Jetsons, right? I mean, (laughs) that was the fiction that technologists you know, brought to life. And so right. I, I, I just want to put it out there for the Imagineers out there. <laughs> and maybe it's worthwhile making con- a connection between Ocean Visions and NASA's, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I love to, it. To learn. Yeah. I think, you know, I'm all about innovation storytelling. So the better the stories that we can conjure, you know, and I still remember taking a tour through Northrop Grumman And they were building a satellite. And I said, when will this be completed? They said 35 years from now. And it's industry certainly has the stomach for long-term timelines, right? Of getting Mm -hmm. things done. And I said, Mm -hmm. not to be naive, but why so long? And they said, some of the components of this satellite have not yet been invented. In fact, we don't have the polymers to create, let's say the handle of a door Hmm. or the handle for this this particular satellite that can withstand both the time and temperature of where the satellite will be headed. So the polymer does not yet exist in humanity. It doesn't exist in the world, but they have every faith 
that 35 years from now and before that someone will have invented it, period. And so it's, you know, most entrepreneurs say they are jumping off a cliff and building the airplane on the way down. Maybe we also need that kind of faith in building, you know, carbon capture systems or decarbonization systems that don't yet exist in the world. Mm -hmm. But we have faith that with, you know, vision that we'll get there. Yes. And with increased attention, right? You know, I, I, I just, I, it, it grieves me when I see a major report like the one that came out on Monday from the IPCC. And what's the IPCC for? Intergovernmental. Oh my goodness. It, it's basically the science body of the United Nations Council, the, the Convention on Climate Change. Gosh, I'm just blanking on the acronym at the moment. We're so used to just calling it the IPCC. Yep. But you know, this is the third report this year in a series of three under their under their sort of ongoing assessment of the climate problem. And this is a report that was signed off by 195 countries. So the the language that was released on Monday, literally, they spent a 40 hour final session reviewing word by word. 195 countries signed off on it, and it it is very grim. And you know that it's. Because of that level of scrutiny, it's already dialed back from probably what it said originally. And yet it got almost no, it, it got almost no coverage. And, you know, the Will Smith, Chris Rock thing certainly got plenty of worldwide coverage, right? That's where we're spending our time, not on something that truly threatens humanity and other life forms on the planet pretty significantly. So as a storyteller, this is where I think that these kinds of movements lack the lack the storytelling knack that actually connects with a human. And, you know, that IPPC report and, you know, having followed it is important because it tells us what's happening to the planet where it fails. It doesn't have tell us what happening, what is happening to us as an individual. Mm -hmm. And as someone right. who was an AIDS educator in brothels in Thailand, working with sex workers and their customers on HIV prevention, Taking that from, you know, get AIDS and die is a pretty straightforward <laughs> message. Right. But, you know, I need to know actually that there will be no more summer vacations in Florida. And I need to know that um, I will be able to spend an average of within the next 20 years leaving my home, I'll be able to spend 10 minutes in the sun before I get a sunburn. And all the SPF in the world won't change that. And frankly, those animals that I care about and love so much, because oftentimes it's so much harder to think about, well, why should I care about X person and X continent is that animals are leaving the planet in numbers we've never seen before. Yeah. And a reminder of what, like, you can say goodbye to a lobster dinner forever, like make it so that I can, you know, one of the elements of great storytelling is using the five senses. So what will smell differently? What will sound differently? What will feel mm. differently? All of those elements that touch the body are an inherent way for the, make those things resonate with me as a storyteller and as a story listener. My brain is hardwired to find the changes in my body when I hear a story. And so talking about climate through the vision of the five senses is just one mm -hmm. way to mm -hmm. make it feel personal in perhaps a way that it hasn't before. Yeah, well, I, I think that takes me right back to Ministry for the Future. I, I think those, you know, those kind of books, the book starts in a very, with a very difficult scene in India, set in India uh, with a massive heat wave and the, the huge disaster and toll that takes. And that, that sort of propels you into why people do what they do following that. So wouldn't it be nice if we could read that and recognize that is in our future? And instead of waiting until it happens, we could start to change now. And so I agree with you. I think, you know, I think painting a picture of what net zero at 2050 is really important. You know, what did the world look like the last time there was 460 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere? What, how can we possibly uh, survive on that planet? So and by the way, the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So it's it's the body that the UN has created of scientists from every country, well, not every country, but many of the countries in the world that come together to do these big assessment reports on the impacts of climate. 
You know, and those reports could be turned into stories because they model with degrees of probability what is going to happen in the future, such as the frequency at which heat waves will occur, the frequency at which superstorms will occur, the loss when we expect coral reefs to blink out completely, you know, with probabilities. It's very, you know, it's very sort of scientific and bureaucratic language, but it's not hard to extrapolate the stories from there. But I agree with you that we really do need to do that. Right. And I hear a storm and I go, oh, well, that happens in that other place, not in New York where I live. Like if it's not- Superstorm like, Sandy. Right. Of course. And so I go, oh, you know, what we heard was a once in a lifetime storm. That's how that was reported, unfortunately. Right. Right. And so this is all in the storytelling. You know, yes. we often say that people only learn in one of two ways. There's experience and there's the story. Experiences don't touch the stove, it's hot, right? That's a sorry, touching the stove and feeling that it's hot and burning yourself. Right, that's experience. Right. And the other is the story that your mom told you don't touch the stove, it's hot, you burn yourself. So, unless you're divinely inspired and you're getting, you know, direct information from somewhere up top, those are the two ways that most humans learn. So, if we can't craft the story, it's actually not even getting into our brain because mm -hmm. even the experience of it. It's kind of like going into labor. You want to forget about it as quickly as possible and just remember the recovery. <laughs> so let's get back to the, the corporate story for just a moment, because mm -hmm. Ocean Visions is doing a lot of amazing work with many different um, partners. Can you walk us through some of the projects that Ocean Visions is working on? And what do you see as having a particularly important impact or a particularly important impetus right now? Yeah. So the core of what we have done has been to create uh, what we call um, a roadmap, and they are not documents, they're, they're web websites that have been the product of bringing together a lot of experts across multiple disciplines, geographies, and sectors to look at these pathways for ocean-based carbon removal. So if we wanted to try to employ the incredible power that the ocean has already to cycle carbon and safely move it to the bottom of the sea, what would be, what would those pathways look like and where are we in their development right now and what's needed to further develop them to the point where we can answer the question, will these contribute to the carbon management challenge that we have? So we developed these roadmaps. They live on our website. They are, again, they're digital and they're modular. They're very concise and they're designed to help guide a bunch of sectors who have interest in moving this field forward as to what the most important things are to work on. So we highlight what we call first order priorities around engineering and science and policy and governance. And now what Ocean Visions does is we catalyze, we seek to catalyze engagement and action against those priorities. We are not trying to do all those things. That's not our model and it wouldn't be possible. We're trying to build a broad community to help make those things happen. So for example, one of the pathways is the potential to increase the alkalinity of the ocean, which would allow it to capture more carbon uh, from the atmosphere. You're saying that the water is too acidic right now. And what's the impact of having an acidic ocean? What's right. happening? Well, what I'm saying is that this is one of the ways the, this is one of the natural ways that the ocean cycles carbon. It's called weathering of, of rocks and minerals, right? That create these, as rocks are exposed to water and rain and also to the sea, they essentially release molecules that are alkaline. That alkalinity goes into the upper layer of the ocean and causes a chemical process that draws carbon down out of the atmosphere and moves some of the dissolved carbon deeper into the ocean. So that's, that's one of the pathways that we explored was all the different ways you might add alkalinity to the ocean. What would be the delivery mechanisms, the engineering, the scaling, the cost. But really importantly is what happens when you do that? What are the chemical reactions? Can they be quantified? What are the environmental impacts? And so those were all laid out as critical barriers and issues in the roadmap. And we just recently, in partnership with Additional Ventures, which is a, a philanthropic fund and a number of other funders, released a request for proposals for $10 million over five years to attack those scientific questions. And we're in the process now with seven uh, finalists who are all writing detailed proposals, one of whom will be awarded this money, and we'll start to advance that science. There's a second 
requests for proposals coming out around the next generation of sensors and the platforms for those sensors that are going to be necessary to actually track what happens chemically in the ocean with alkalinity enhancement. So that's, you know, back to your Northrop uh, Grumman example, that's technology that has to be invented in order to support this field. And we're putting out a request for proposals for that technology. There's probably people who have pieces of it. Maybe they have 90% of what's needed, but the RFP hopefully will galvanize that additional push to, you know, for people to create the sensors that we're going to need. So that's, those are the examples of how we're trying to work. We've identified the problems pretty carefully and identified what the pathways are to addressing those problems or building out those technologies. And now we're catalyzing a community of action. And we are about to take this um, globally because we've just been, we're about to be designated under the UN Decade of Ocean Sciences for Sustainable Development as a UN Decade Collaborative Center, which will help us work with people in a lot of other parts of the world on some of these same approaches and solutions. And this combined approach, right? I mean, this kind of holistic approach is so critical, but sometimes it just, I mean, it, I'm sure you hear it all the time and it must be the most annoying thing ever. It feels so daunting. Is there a way that you counsel or advise companies to begin looking at their about their own impact, especially on this path to, you know, restore and repair? Is it figure out your supply chain and figure out where your carbon impact is greatest? Is that where all things begin? Well, I mean, again, there's sort of two parts to this challenge. One is turning off the tap and that's the decarbonization. That's getting, you know, moving as quickly as possible to renewable energy and to, you know, non-fossil fuel based packaging and all of that, right? that companies can be doing right now. And there's hundreds of thousands of people working on that around the globe and there's momentum. It needs to be accelerated much more quickly. The second piece, which is cleaning up the gigantic mass of pollution that we've created is in its nascency, barely in its nascency as an endeavor. So that requires much more of the long-term thinking, but beginning to position now for figuring out, okay, if we are going to commit to being carbon negative, we have to figure out how to clean up the footprint that we've created and that others have created. What's our particular niche? What's our particular contribution that we might make? For some companies, it could just be money to, as part of a coalition, you know, that's backing the mass of the, the needed research and development. Some companies, it could be building component parts of the systems that are going to be necessary to capture and store carbon. It's again, it's the enterprise that's going to be needed to to capture, to, to remove and safely store the majority of this carbon that we've released is going to be similar to the scale of what has caused the release, right? So all of our energy infrastructure, our transportation infrastructure, our food and agriculture infrastructure, our manufacturing, those are the infrastructures that have created this massive release of, of CO2 it's not going to be a small endeavor to clean it up. So we just have to accept that's the reality. There's simply no easy fix to this problem. And there's simply no way to fix this problem without industry and technology. Full stop. And when you see, like, are there new businesses forming that you're like, dear God, we're unleashing more, more insanity on the planet when it comes to carbon as a result of new entrepreneurial ventures, let's say, like the proliferation of Uber, right? O versus the taxis that used to be on the street and just the number of new cars, right? That are impacting cities and so forth. Do you look at those innovations and say, it's one step forward, two steps back, unless we could turn that entire fleet into electric vehicles? Well, I mean, this is one of the biggest challenges is that we're trying to manage the behavior of 7 billion human beings on the planet. And I think we all know that sort of voluntary action is unlikely to be the way that happens. And I think we're also pretty aware that draconian authoritarian rules are pretty unlikely to be successful. We do have models for success, right? We know that fiscal policy and taxation and, and incentive 
economic incentives work really well to guide behavior. So if carbon cost, what has been calculated as the social cost of carbon is around $180 a ton, I think. If we were operating with that cost being embedded directly to the emitters, people would change their behavior very quickly. Right. right? And the investors so, wouldn't allow them to continue doing if they knew it was going right. to cost their investment dollars that much more. Exactly. So, you know, things like the Uber example and you know other things that are the other innovations that continue to prosper in a world where pollution is free and carbon pollution is free. Mm. We can't stop those until carbon pollution is not free. In my view, we're mm. not going to stop them simply by commitments and pledges. We see all these commitments and pledges that aren't being met because the economic incentive is overwhelmingly to keep polluting at the moment because there's no the biosphere is free. It's a free dump, right? It's a free dump. And so we've got to change that. And again, going back to, you know, Kim Stanley Robinson's book, I'm really plugging him. I hope he's going to, uh, <laughs> he's going to appreciate this, this idea of a digital currency based on removal of carbon I think is brilliant, right? Because you're giving, you're actually creating a currency that has a value only, you can only achieve that value by removing carbon from the atmosphere. And then you get, it's like the mining Bitcoin, which I have no idea why that creates value, but I do understand how removing carbon would create value. And then you get awarded currency for that. Those are the kind of breakthrough types of ideas that could turn this thing around very quickly. Mm, So important. So important. Innovation. That's innovation, right? That's economic monetary policy innovation. Right. We could use some of that. Yeah. As opposed to the drag that Bitcoin and other, you know, crypto mining tactics are really unleashing on the planet too. Exactly. Exactly. Well, this has just been a fascinating conversation, Uh, Brad. I'm so grateful that you could come on the show today. So we typically end the show with three questions for our innovators. So I'm going to put you on the hot seat for a moment. Greatest innovation of all time. What do you think it is? Greatest innovation of all time. Choose from your top three, if you like. (laughs) Well, I mean, you got to go back probably to the wheel, but I would say... Computing Uh Mm -hmm. in its grandest form. Yeah. Yeah. And if there was an innovation team that you would love to join or have joined in the past, what innovation team would you have loved to have been a part of? Would like well, to. I love the I love NASA, you know, and all the innovation that's happened around space. But if I'd go back farther, you know, something like Bell Laboratories would have been an amazing, mm. amazing place because it really was just a, an incredible hub of innovation. But you know, you've got ARPA, E, and DARPA have done some incredible things. You know, there's just so much. Yeah, and an innovation you'd love to see in the world that doesn't yet exist, something that drives you absolutely insane that you wish somebody would just invent a solution for, what would that be? Limitless green energy, easily available. Mm. So we could do away with fossil fuels forever. Yep, and we could power the cleanup of carbon uh, in the atmosphere because many of the pathways to clean carbon up in the atmosphere require electricity. And if you're not getting that electricity from clean green sources, then it's not a smart equation. Yeah. Oh, well, from your lips to the powers that be's ears, right, <laughs> that we can uncover that. Brad, thank you so much for joining you. me on the podcast today. It was really an honor to have you. No, thank you. It was a pleasure to be here and an honor to be here as well. Now you might be asking, Susan, why innovation storytelling? Well, the truth is that an innovation story told well not only breaks down communication barriers so you can drive change and new growth, but it also helps other people remember and champion your work. And it propels your best ideas forward faster to secure you the runway, resources, and recognition you so richly deserve. In other words, stories are memory-making devices that significantly reduce the time it takes for you and your innovation to be understood. But like many leaders, you probably never got the memo that storytelling skills would be central to your success. Well, I've got some good news for you. It's not too late because I've got you covered. Whether you need an expert to come and speak to your innovation leaders, you need training in the art and method of innovation storytelling, or you just need the support and guidance of a consultant who can get you where you want to go in less time, visit www.susanlinder.com today 
to learn more and to set up a call to discuss your needs. I'm so looking forward to connecting with you and to helping you tell a great innovation story. If you like what you heard so far, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another episode and leave us a comment. Tell us what you think of this episode. We'd love to hear from you. And if you didn't like what you've heard, just forget everything I've said.